great and glorious King. You are strong when you feel weak. In your brokenness, complete. Welcome everyone this morning. It's a cold one outside, but we're nice and warm in here in the Lord's house. It's lovely to see you all. Uh, just a couple of things before we start. Um, Mairi um, has told me this morning that we have £170 for the Macmillan from the coffee morning. So well done everybody that came along and supported it. The food bank, the food that we had in, in the boxes, which was overflowing, has now been uplifted. So the boxes are looking a wee bit empty. So if we could start bringing in some more stuff for the food bank. And the last thing I want to talk about is the shoe boxes. We're on a build up now to start getting things for the shoe boxes. Um, we don't have a date for when they're going to be uplifted, but my will keep us up to date with that. Now, this morning, it's my pleasure to welcome Willie Wright back and Ina. It's lovely to have them here. It's always a lovely time when they come. So we pray that God blesses Willie as he brings the message and that we all enjoy what he has to say. Welcome. 
Thanks very much, Eunice, for that welcome. It's always a joy to uh, come along with you now. Baptist Church this morning. As many of you know, Stuart Wordsworth is preaching in Irvine this morning, and Alec and uh, Brenda are, are with him as well. So it's an exchange, if you want. Uh, but it's great to be with you, and as I say, we bring greetings from, from Irvine. Uh, we are here to worship God. Let's uh, listen to God's Word. One or two excerpts from Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. He forgives. He redeems. He crowns you with love and compassion. He is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for us. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Praise the Lord, O my soul. We're going to praise the Lord as we sing together a hymn written by Henry Francis Light, who for 23 years or so was minister at Brixham uh, in Devon, and uh, he based uh, his hymn that we sing now on these words of Psalm 103. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring. Let's continue to worship God as we come to him in prayer. Let us all pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we come to praise you this morning and to join our praise with countless numbers throughout the world and the heavenly host around the throne. We bow before you in worship 
And we thank and praise you for all that you are and for all that, all that you have done for us. You are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. You are a God who forgives and redeems, a God who does not hold our sins against us or treat us as we deserve. And we have come into this place this morning to praise you in word and in song, and we ask your blessing on our time of worship, and we pray that you will bless those who join with us online. Bless us this morning, we pray, with a sense of your presence, wherever we are, as we gather round the throne in praise and prayer, as we gather round your word to hear what you have to say, and as those of us here in this building gather round the table to remember the Lord in his death as we take bread and wine. Bless us, we pray, and bless those who share in this service. And grant to all of us a spirit of worship, an open ear, and that special awareness that you're with us and that you love us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A lot has happened since I was last with you here in Guruk. A new prime minister, a new chancellor or two, a new monarch on the throne, and a new king acceding to the throne. I'm not going to comment on the first few, but uh, the new monarch on the throne, we pray for him, but we give thanks to God for his mother. We give thanks to God for his, her faithful service. And many of us have had that opportunity over the weeks to reflect on that and to reflect on how she served the Lord in the work that she did. And uh, there were many moving things about the funeral services that were held. And coming through it all was her living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, that was marvelous. Uh, for her 90th birthday, there was a lovely book came out it was called The Servant Queen and the King She Serves. She was always conscious of that. She served a king, and uh, she acknowledged him as Lord. And uh, increasingly in her Christmas messages, she was uh, forthright in speaking of our Savior, whose birth we celebrate at Christmas. Now, I never met the queen. Maybe some of you did, but I never did. I can remember as a primary school child going along to King's Park Avenue with my wee flag when she was passing there going down to Rutherglen. And uh, I can remember waving it away. I can remember being in Dumbarton when she went through there. She passed Ina's aunt's house. Uh, they stayed in an interesting place called uh, Bruce's Stables. And it was a very, very historic place. And it was on the main road, uh, going from Dumbarton over to Cardross. And uh, it was interesting that when she passed by, the Lord Lieutenant was with her, and no doubt pointing out this beautiful building, and, uh, which had been newly painted white. If she'd gone round the back, she would have discovered that they didn't paint the back bit, but they painted the front bit. Now, as I say, I never met the Queen. But let me tell you about someone who did. For 12 years, I was minister of the congregation in Dumfries. And uh, it was 1995, and I was visiting a family uh, who were very involved in the life of the church. And it was coming up to Easter. And uh, as I spoke to them, I said to them, Now, have you got any plans for Easter? Dad was a, a, an English teacher in uh, Dumfries Academy. Mom worked in the hospital in the radiography department. And they had two charming daughters. One was called Natalia, and one was called Oriana. And I said to them, have you got any plans for Easter? And they looked at one another, almost suspiciously. And then they said, will we tell him? I think we will. Seeing you're our minister, we'll tell you, but don't tell anyone until it happens. And I swore, I will not tell anyone until it happens. And then they told me the story. 
Oriana wrote to the Queen. Her Majesty the Queen, Buckingham Palace, London. Dear Queen, my name is Oriana and I attend Georgetown Primary School in uh, Dumfries. And I believe that you are going to launch a ship with my name, Oriana. And I wondered if I could perhaps come and help you. Yours sincerely, Oriana Kelly. Well, what happened? Well, after a little while, a letter came from Buckingham Palace. And it said, Dear Miss Kelly, thank you so much for your letter. The Queen thanks you for the kind offer to come and help her to launch the ship. And then it went on. Unfortunately, the ship has already been launched. However, it has to receive its lovely name down in Southampton at the beginning of April. And uh, the ship belongs to P&O Company. And so we have sent your letter on to Lord Sterling, who is chairman of that company. Thank you very much for your letter and for your kind offer. Yours sincerely on behalf of Her Majesty. Blah, blah, blah. And uh, that was it. But that wasn't the end of it. Because a few days later, a letter came from P&O, from Lord Sterling. And it said, Dear Miss Kelly, your letter has been passed on to me from the palace. And we wondered if you would like to come down to Southampton along with your sister and your mum and dad to see the naming of the ship, Oriana. We will put you up in a hotel and we will give you a tour of the ship and you will meet Her Majesty during your visit. If this is acceptable to you, it said, if this is acceptable to you, we will send tickets for your journey down and book you in for the hotel. Yours sincerely, Lord Sterling, p &O. Wow. It was amazing, wasn't it? It was unbelievable. But I tell you, it's true. And uh, they went down. And it was exactly as it was in the hotel, down to Southampton, tour of the ship meeting Her Majesty the Queen with their flowers and handing them over, both Natalia and Oriana. And uh, it happened. I know it happened because I believed it would happen because they told me and they didn't tell lies. And I know it happened because it was all over the papers up here in Scotland. And I happened to be down in Southampton actually just a week or so afterwards as it happened. And it was still there in the papers there uh, Oriana meets her namesake in Southampton, and uh, there it was. An unbelievable but true story of how that little girl in De Vries uh, met the Queen at uh, the naming of the ship, Oriana. Many years ago, when I was growing up, we used to sing a hymn, It Is a Thing Most Wonderful almost too wonderful to be that God's own son should come from heaven and die to save a child like me. And yet I know that it is true. That's what we used to sing. And that is unbelievable, isn't it? That that should be the case. But it is true and we rejoice in it. I think it's a lovely story about Oriana and it tells us something about the queen. She did answer letters and she was concerned about uh, all the letters that were passed on to her. And I pass it on to you uh, this morning. We're going to sing a lovely hymn, well-known hymn, written by Fanny Crosby, uh, who wrote more hymns than Charles Wesley even. And the hymn is, To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life an atonement for sin and open the life gate that all may go in. Let's stand to sing.
now Mary is going to come and uh, lead us in prayer of intercession, and then uh, Lorna is going to read to us from Luke's Gospel, chapter 14. Good morning. Um, let us start with some, some silent prayer for those close to us as individuals. Let us remember some members of the church family who are in need of prayer. Happy to say that Anne Forsyth was on the list because she's been ill and been in hospital, but delighted to see that Anne is here this morning and looking well. We thank you for that, Lord. We pray for Elizabeth and Helen. We, we pray that things will start to go better for Elizabeth. She has to have two more heart tests and she won't have surgery, if at all, until next year. We pray for Helen as she seeks to look after her daughter. We're also pleased to see Alan and Lorna back with us again, have, having had a bad week of illness. We, we thank you for that, Lord, that they are better now. And we, but we do pray for Craig, their son, who is waiting to have surgery. Lord, we would pray for our country and the difficult situation we are in just now. We pray for those in, in, in government and that they will seek your guidance for the months ahead and that great things will start to take place again. We pray for those in our country who are finding life so difficult just now, particularly financially. We thank you, Lord, for the, the food banks here and throughout the country and for the I-58 people who give people help for financial problems. Lord, we, pray, we thank you for these and we pray that people will continue to be able to benefit from these, these food banks. Lord, we would help us all to be generous to those who are in difficulties Lord, so many of us here are not in great difficulties ourselves, but Lord, help us to be generous, to give to others who are struggling. And Lord, we would also um, pray for all the dreadful things that are going on in the world just now. There are so many, but Russia and the Ukraine, Afghanistan and Iran, and Pakistan and so many others, so many awful things happening. Lord, we do pray that great, great things can be done there, that there'll be a real moving of your spirit in all of these places and with the charities who aim to work in these countries. Lord, we pray that they will bring about, you will bring about peace to so many people who are living in danger and fear. Lord, we cannot imagine just how, what these people are going through, but Lord, we do pray that good things will happen. Lord, hear our prayers, and may we all be aware of your presence with us today and in the week ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Our reading this morning is from Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 35. And the heading at this section is The Cost of Being a Disciple. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot 
be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundations and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000. If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure hip. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the word of God for the people of God. And thanks be to God. Thanks very much, Lorna, and thanks, uh, Mary. We're going to sing another hymn. It's really a prayer. Master, speak, thy servant heareth, waiting for thy gracious word.
Our thanks again to Gary and Norman and to those who behind the scenes prepare for our service today. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, that is our prayer this morning, that you will speak and that we will listen. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will speak through your, heart, your word to our hearts now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I can well remember many years ago as a teenager, and that was many years ago, uh, discovering for the first time that the word Christian only appeared three times in my New Testament. Now, like many of you, I was brought up on the King James Version, published in 1611. Uh, we called it the Authorized Version, which gave it really quite a dignity, and it made it very difficult for subsequent translations to even stand a chance against the Authorized Version, as if the others were unauthorized. But you know what I mean. But in the authorized version, or the King James Version of 1611, which we were using in the 1950s when I discovered, only three times is that word mentioned. Mentioned once by Simon Peter in one of the letters that he wrote uh, to people who were suffering for Jesus, and he spoke about suffering for being a Christian. And it's mentioned twice by Dr. Luke in that wonderful account of the early church that he wrote, which we call the Acts of the Apostles. On two separate occasions, he uses the word Christian. You may remember that uh, Paul, on one occasion, had to stand before King Agrippa, and Paul uh, told his story, how he was on the road to Damascus to persecute those who were following the Lord Jesus Christ, and how on the road he was confronted by the risen Christ himself, and he did a U-turn, and his life was changed completely. And King Agrippa, as he listened to all this, was very impressed, and he said, you all must persuade me to become a Christian. I think in the King James Version, all must thou persuadest me to become a Christian. And the other reference is in uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 26, where uh, Dr. Luke is telling us about the church at Antioch and how they spread the good news of Jesus. And then almost as a little historical note, he says this, it was at Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. Antioch, that's where it came. Christians, they called them, and the name stuck. Now, there are two Antiochs in the Acts of the Apostles, one in Pisidia and one in Syria. This one is the one in Syria. Antioch in Syria was the third greatest city in the Roman Empire after Rome and Alexandria. It was Antioch. It was some city famous for so many things, a famous perhaps infamous, for its nightclubs and its casinos and its brothels. It was out of bounds to soldiers who were off duty. Uh, they weren't to go to Antioch, it was said. It was also famous for its sport. Uh, the sport in particular was chariot racing, and teams would be set one against the other. And these teams would sport colors, believe it or not. And the two main teams in Antioch for the chariot races, one team supported the Greens, and one team, would you believe it, supported the Blues. And these Greens and Blues fought it out on the chariot race. But they were also famous in Antioch for giving nicknames. Uh, so when the Emperor Julian on one occasion uh, visited them. He had a great big hairy beard, and they christened him the goat, the goat. And it was at Antioch, says Dr. Luke, that it was that the disciples of Jesus were first called Christians, probably as a nickname. They go on about Christ. Uh, hopefully, they lived like Christ. 
And so the people of Antioch called them Christ ones, Christians. And that's the name that has stuck down through the years. Followers of Jesus are Christians. Now, you I, and I know that the word Christian is used in so many different ways to, so ma to mean so many different things these days that you wonder what people think of when they think of the word Christian. You see, the word Christian wasn't the word that was used in the early days of the Christian church to describe those who followed Jesus and his ways. The word that was used in the Gospels and in the Acts of the Apostles and it's used 264 times, was the word disciple. Disciple. A follower of Jesus was a disciple. And what does the word disciple mean? Yes, of course, it means a learner. But Wikipedia sometimes can be helpful. You look it up, you know, to see background of words and the like. And Wikipedia, interestingly enough, uh, said this, discipleship uh, is not the same as being a student in the modern sense. A disciple in the ancient biblical world actively imitated both the life and the teaching of the master. It was a deliberate apprenticeship which made the fully formed disciple a living copy of the master. That's it. That's what a disciple was 2,000 years ago. Many years ago, I came across a rather colorful character from the Argentine called Juan Carlos Ortiz. And I met him, and I heard him preaching, and I read one of his books, or a couple of his books, on discipleship. Let me quote to you from what he said. A disciple, he says, is a person who learns to live the life of his teacher lives. Again, discipleship is more than getting to know what the teacher knows. It is getting to be what he is. And finally, the making of a disciple means the creating of a duplicate. Challenging words, but that's what discipleship is. When Jesus sent his disciples into the world, in words that we often refer to as the Great Commission, what did he say? He said, go out into all the world and make disciples of all nations. That will include baptizing them. It will include teaching them, not just teaching them stuff, but teaching them how to observe, how to put into practice the teaching of Jesus. Picture the scene for a moment. It is the night on which Jesus was betrayed. And Jesus is carted off, and on one, at one particular juncture, he is taken to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. And as he is in there, out there in the courtyard, Simon Peter is warming his hands at a charcoal fire, and people are gathered round. And then finally, he is accosted. He is accosted by someone who says, aren't you one of this man's disciples? And he says, no, not me. And a second time, he's accosted, you were one of his disciples. No. And not only does he say no, he vehemently says no. He curses, he swears. And it happens a third time as well. No, I'm not one of this man's disciples. The cock crowed. And just as Jesus had predicted, he had denied him three times. I'm no disciple of Jesus. Well, a few moments ago, we read a strange passage from Luke's Gospel, chapter 14. And I encourage you to look at it with me just for a few moments. Just let me remind you of the context in which this uh, passage occurs. Jesus is being followed by a large crowd. They're keen to hear what he says. They're keen to know what he's all about. And it's almost as if Jesus stops in his tracks and turns round and he says, look, do you really understand 
what it will mean if you become one of my disciples and follow me? Do you really understand what's involved in discipleship? And so he lays it on the line, what it means to be his disciple. And uh, he doesn't pull punches. In fact, it's almost as if he's putting them off. And when you read some of the things he says, you, you think, well, well, people will say, no, 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 I, I'm not for that. Let's consider what he says in these statements. For if you look at it, if you have your Bible there, in verse 26 and in verse 27 and in verse 33, you have the phrase, you cannot be my disciple. Unless you, unless, unless you cannot be my disciple. These are the conditions of discipleship. This is what's involved if you're really going to be one of my disciples. And the first condition uh, is mentioned in verse 26. And it's a corker, as we read it uh, this morning. It's read like this, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And we say, surely never. Surely never. What on earth do you mean by that? The language is striking. It's strong. It's strange. You might think it's even shocking what he says here as he lays it on the line. Jesus is quite obviously not saying, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be my disciple, you've got to start hating your relatives. He's not saying that. I mean, some people don't go on too well with some of the relatives. That's true. That's why the Reverend I am Jolly, you know, could appear and say, did you have a good Christmas or did your relatives come? But uh, he's not saying, no, no, hate all these people. And if you don't, you can't be my disciple. This is the vivid language of the East at the time. It didn't mean hating. It meant this, look, as far as things go, I come first. I come first before all these people. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, parallel, if anyone wants to come with me, Jesus said, he must forget self, take up his cross every day, and follow me. It's the vivid language of the East. Matthew said, parallel, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me, Jesus said. Anyone who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's what Jesus was getting at. Not saying hate that lot. He's saying, yeah, love these people. But by comparison, wow, I have to come first. It's a big ask. But Jesus says that's what discipleship is all about. C.T. Studd was an interesting character. You may know something about him. He was a, he was a first-class uh, cricketer, played for England and Cambridge. And uh, he was also a, an interesting Christian who served the Lord in India and uh, China and Africa. And he was the founder of Worldwide Evangelization Crusade, whose headquarters used to be across the river there uh, in Kilcreggan. And uh, he was a, an unusual character in some ways, when he got engaged to his dear uh, girlfriend, her fiance, uh, he, he gave her a little poem. And he said, I want you to repeat this every day as we lead up to our marriage. And uh, she agreed. And the little poem that he wrote, well, I call it a poem. It's uh, a bit of doggerel, but it just said this. She had to say every day, Jesus, I love you. You are to me dearer than Charlie ever could be. Jesus, I love you. You are to me dearer than Charlie ever could be. That was his way of saying, look, we're going to get married, and I love you, and you love me, but Jesus comes 
first in our lives. And that's the first uh, reference there uh, that Jesus makes concerning what is involved in being his disciple. Uh, he said, if you don't have that priority of loving me, then you cannot be my disciple. But there's a second one there, and uh, it's in verse 27. Anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, taking up the cross is willingly enduring suffering for the sake of Christ. We probably don't realize today uh, the sheer horror that that phrase must have had for Jesus' contemporaries. Um, I mentioned a, a few moments ago a quotation from Luke chapter 9, verse 23, which should have come at this bit, not earlier when I did put it in. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, if anyone wants to come with me, he must forget self, deny himself, take up his cross every day, and follow me. And Jesus says, if we're not willing to do that, you can't be my disciple. Deny yourself heard of a missionary who was going back to the mission field having had a time of furlough at home and his home church had arranged a valedictory service and uh, as invitations had been sent out he received one inviting him to the valedictory service for this missionary and his wife and he stood up and he said I have invite, been invited to come along tonight to say farewell to myself <laughs> I've come along tonight to say farewell to myself. Well, that's what Jesus says. If we're going to be his disciples, we say farewell to ourselves. We deny ourselves, say no to ourselves, and then take up his cross, identifying ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Roman writer Cicero tells that the very word cross, uh, that infamous and unhappy tree, he called it, was an abomination to Roman ears. And we know too how repugnant it was to the Jews. And yet Jesus said to these would-be followers that unless they take up the cross, identify themselves with him, they could not be his disciples. They could be his admirers. They could be his hangers-on. But they couldn't be disciples. A man carrying his cross was only going one way in Jesus' day. He was going to his execution. It meant suffering. It meant death. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a pastor in Germany uh, just before the Second World War and who stood up against the Nazis and paid for it with his life, ended up as a, a prisoner in Flossenburg and was executed just a couple of days before the armistice. He has a book called The Cost of Discipleship, and it begins with these words. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And that's what Jesus was saying here in that second reference there in verse 27. And finally, the reference uh, to which I draw your attention in verse 33 is, a, is another staggering one when Jesus says, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. And we think that's a bit much, surely. We've got to give up everything that we have. Otherwise, we can't be disciples. Surely a bit much. It's John Stott, who, as a student at Cambridge University, uh, recalled that uh, he would go up uh, to the library and there was always a gentleman there who would come forward to see how he could uh, help the student to find any particular book. And uh, this young man, uh, his English was not perfect, but his manners were impeccable. And John Stott says, I used to uh, picture him and he would come up and he would stand in front of you and he would say, Please dispose of me as you wish. Please dispose of me as you wish. 
It was his lovely way of saying, I'm at your disposal. What do you want me to do for you? Now, a disciple is a person who says to the Lord Jesus Christ, please dispose of me as you wish. I'm totally at your disposal. Do you remember Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus Road? Do you remember how he met the risen Christ? Do you remember how he fell down on his knees and his first question was, who are you, Lord? And his second question was, what will you have me do? What will you have me do? I'm at your disposal. And that's what being a disciple of Jesus is. Saying to the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm completely at your disposal. All that I have, I give over to you. One very flamboyant American used to say, you know, here in America, we think there's nothing better than a tither. If you give a tenth, wow. You not only attend service on a Sunday, you not only attend in the evening, but you give a tithe. Wow, you've really arrived. He said, I don't ever remember singing the hymn one-tenth to Jesus I surrender, one-tenth to him I freely give. No, we sing all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. And Jesus is saying that's discipleship. Give it all. And he gives you it back and says, well, you've got to pay the butcher and you've got to pay the grocer and you've got to pay the rent and you've got to pay your mortgage. But everything you've handed over to me and you spend as what money that has been entrusted to your care. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. I first heard about David Brainerd many years ago in Largs. As children, we used to go to Fairley for our holidays, year after year, when we were tiny, and the sands were great. And uh, then one year, my parents decided we were going to have a change. And so we went to Largs instead, four miles or so along the road. And for years afterwards, it was Largs we went to. And we went down to the open air mission. Willie Doherty used to lead it with uh, friends that would come from Wake and elsewhere. Uh, uh, and they would be there at the front uh, conducting their services and at the evening and then at the afternoon, you're down to the pencil and playing uh, games and so on. And it was there I first heard about David Brainerd. It was there I first met Norman McCary, actually, because he used to go uh, to Largs as well and to the Open Air Mission uh, down at the front. David Brainerd, a young man who had a burden for Native Americans. In the old days, we called them Red Indians. But uh, we heard the story of David Brainerd and how he went around these encampments and how he met these Native Americans and how he preached the gospel to them and how on one occasion he stood there and he offered them Christ and he told them how much God loved them and that Jesus had given himself on the cross for him. And as he preached, the Indian chief came forward with his blanket in response and said, Big chief, he bring his blanket to Jesus. And he just laid it down at the feet of David Brainerd. David Brainerd went on preaching. And after he preached a little further, the Indian chief came forward again, this time with his tomahawk, not raised like that, but just in his hand, prized possession like the blanket. And he laid it down and he said, Indian chief, he bring his tomahawk to Jesus. And as David Brainerd went on, uh, he was surprised to hear the clip-clop of hooves coming round the side of the tent. And this big white horse appeared. And the Indian chief said, big Indian chief, he bring his horse to Jesus. And uh, David Brainerd was almost finished by then. And uh, as he finished up, the Indian chief just went forward and he said, big chief, he bring himself to Jesus. And that's what it's about. That's discipleship when we bring ourselves to Jesus. That's what Jesus meant when he said, if you 
don't give up all that you have, you cannot be my disciple, because discipleship is giving our all. Bishop Taylor Smith was a well-known figure at the Keswick Convention in the north of England for a number of years some time ago. He was a large man, an Anglican. He would wear a surplice normally if he was preaching on a Sunday, and he was just referred to uh, as the bishop. And uh, it's said that on one occasion he sent his surplus to the laundry and got back a note saying, to the laundering of one small bell tent, two and six months. But he was a big man. And he was asked on one occasion, what is the secret of your Christian living? And he said, well, there's one thing I do every morning before I get up. I say to God, oh God, this bed on which I lie is the altar. And this body is the sacrifice. And today, afresh, I yield myself to you to be what you want me to be, to say what you want me to say, to go where you want me to go. That's discipleship. And Bishop Taylor Smith had cracked it. Now, if you're anything like me, reading a passage like Luke chapter 14 25 to 35 that we read this morning. Challenging would-be followers concerning discipleship. You will perhaps feel as I felt as I reread it. Goodness me. I've got a long way to go. You might even feel have I even begun if that's what it means to be a disciple, an apprentice, learning the ropes, being formed into the image of our master. But it is to this that we're called. I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon that it was at Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. I wonder if we could reverse it. I wonder if we could pray, perhaps, that all of us who claim to be Christians might truly be disciples of Jesus. We also recall that night when Jesus was betrayed. When Peter was asked that question, aren't you one of this man's disciples? And Simon Peter said, no, never. Never. And then went on for the rest of his life to prove that he was truly a disciple of Jesus. I would much rather have someone who slipped up and who said, no, I, I'm not a disciple, but then went on and proved that they were, than have someone who said, yes, I'm a disciple of Jesus and then go on to prove with the rest of their life that they were nothing of the kind. May God grant us the grace and the strength to be truly his disciples for his name's sake. Let's pray. Lord, as we approach you in prayer, we remind ourselves of some of the other things Jesus said. If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, thus showing yourself to be my disciples. Oh, Lord, we do want to be disciples of Jesus. We do want to obey his teaching, to take it in and to live it out. We do want to be marked by those who love one another. We do want to be those who show forth in our lives the fruit of the Spirit. Disciples of Jesus, that's what we are called to be, and that's what the world needs to see. May our response this morning be just that, Lord. Yes, 
That's what we want to be. And by your grace and in your strength, that's what we resolve to be. Amen. As we gather round the table, we're going to sing a lovely song. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son. God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One, Jesus, my Redeemer, name above all names, precious Lamb of God. Messiah, oh, for sinners slain. serve my King forever in that holy place. Thank you, oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Precious Lamb of God, Messiah, oh, Holy One. Thank you, oh, my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit to the world. Jesus, my Redeemer, name above all names, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, O oh, for sinners slain. That picture of the Lamb runs right through the Bible, as you know. Go way back to, to Genesis. Read the story of Abraham and Isaac as they go up to offer a sacrifice. Listen to the conversation that they have one with the other, and Isaac speaks and says to his father, and Abraham says, yes, my son. And Isaac says, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham's reply is this, listen, God will provide himself the lamb. God will provide himself the lamb, and he did. Turn over to Exodus and read about the Passover. Read about the fact that the lamb had to be taken, selected, set apart, and then slain, and the blood of that lamb put on the doorposts and on the upper lintel. And deliverance was brought to the people. And of course, it was in a Passover context that Jesus gathered 
his disciples around him on the night when he was betrayed. And with that picture of the Passover in their minds, when they were rescued through the blood, Jesus instituted the feast that we call the Lord's Supper. But travel right through the Old Testament and see he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Go into the New Testament and see John the Baptist on the banks of the River Jordan pointing to Jesus and saying, look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And go right through to the book of Revelation and see that picture around the throne and see Jesus standing in the midst of the throne, slain but standing, victorious. And the song that is sung, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And so on that night when Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples. He took bread and he broke it and spoke of his body. He took the cup and said, it is the new covenant in my blood. And we are encouraged as we gather together and take these elements to remember the Lord in his dying for us as the Lamb of God. We're going to give thanks now for the bread and wine, and Margaret will lead us in our prayer. Lord and Heavenly Father, we just come before you, and we just praise and honor your name. We ask you, Lord, to bless this bread and wine as we remember the painful sacrifice your son went through for each one of us here. Jesus' blood was shed, even his very head, when the crown of thorns was forced down onto his brow, as he died on agony, lifted up, nailed to that cross at Calvary, taking our sins onto himself. But death could not, could not hold him. He arose after three days, he, the resurrection from the dead, and his disciples witnessed it. Lord, we ask you to bless this bread and wine as we take this, as we wait for Jesus to return once again. Lord, bless this bread and wine in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus took bread and broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. We take the cup that speaks of the blood of the Lord Jesus, and we remember his love for us as we prepare to drink together.
Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. All of you drink of it in remembrance of me. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to remember Jesus in the way that he has appointed. Help us, we pray, not to forget him in the days that lie ahead. Help us rather to live for him. And may his words dwell within us. And help us, we pray, by your Spirit to live out the teaching of Jesus and to live the life of Christ himself by the power of the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. May God's blessings surround you each day. As you trust Him,